Hello, and welcome back to another episode of the Best Damn Pod in the Land. I am your host and sports director, Brian Nelson, and with me I have... Andy Anders, assistant sports editor. The one and only? Not the only, No, he's not the one and only. It's just, one Andy only. only. Wow. just Andy Anders. No, I am the one and only, but they know it. They know it already this week. <laughs> they, they <laughs> Considering we commented on it, I don't know. I am your assistant sports director, Khalid Hashi. And I'm your sports editor, Griffin Strom. And we do not have a game to recap, but we do have a game to preview. Actually, two games to preview. Actually, a season to preview with Ohio State men's basketball opening up their season tomorrow against Cincinnati. And then, of course, Ohio State football is playing Maryland this Saturday at noon in Columbus. So we got, are going to preview both of those games. And then also later in the, on in the podcast, give our thoughts on you know what our top fours would be for the college football playoffs, since rankings are coming out for that tonight. But first, let's dive into football and get this Maryland preview rocking. Andy, start us off. Well, um, following the big showing that Ohio State put against Wisconsin, that dominating win against their first team that everyone thought could actually give them a challenge, a nationally relevant team perhaps, before they lost to Illinois, um, then you enter the bye, you get healthy, and now you come out and you play... Maryland, who doesn't rank higher than 50th in any major offensive category. Um, defense doesn't fare much better. This is a team that was ranked at one point in the season, actually, but uh, that was after they beat Syracuse, and since then they have <laughs> haven't done so well. Yeah, and so, um, yeah. Currently on a four-game losing streak, 3-6 and six on the season. Uh, you'd expect Ohio State to come out and dominate this matchup and then you can't even consider it a track game because they have Rutgers after this. Griffin, is there any way in your mind that Maryland ha- gets out of the first quarter with this being a game? First quarter, I only will say uh, possibly just because of we've seen Ohio State have some flat first quarters recently. But um, even if they do, it's still they, they won't make it past the first half with it being any type of game. Um, and I'm being a little generous anyway there. Um, you know, last year after that uh, that game, that was that's you know a hot topic on everybody's mind in the media um, this week ahead of this game. That fifty two fifty one thrilling game uh, last year probably shouldn't have been quite so thrilling in a lot of Ohio State uh, player coaches and fans minds, and um, that's what they're hoping to avoid this year. And a lot of players talked about um, and the coaching staff today touched on just how last year's win um, and th- just how competitive that game was is inspiring them to come with you know. A much better performance uh, this season. Yeah, I definitely agree. I think we're going to, you know, we've been talking repeatedly about how Ohio State isn't underestimating any game really this season because we don't, they don't want to lose a trap game like Purdue or Iowa that will cost them a spot in the college football playoff. And right now, if they keep winning, they're on track to make into the college football playoff, especially with wins over Penn State and Michigan up, upcoming. So they just got to keep things going on steady for the next two weeks and then the real test happens. So. Yeah, I feel like um, Ohio State will dominate this game. Um, looking at Maryland's schedule, they have lost four straight. Their last win was against Rutgers, um, and they've lost their last six of their last seven games. Um, and they've given up 59 points to Penn State, and they've given up 52 points to Minnesota. Um, so if that tells you anything, I feel like Ohio State's going to be do for another large scoring game um, in which we'll see Chuganoff probably start off the second half, in my opinion. I think we'll see a lot of the backups and young guys get just another game under their belt. I think there was someone who pointed out that the high seas backups have seen playing time in every single game so far this season, um, which is pretty crazy to think about because going into the season, that was like the one thing that we needed to know. That was like the biggest question mark was depth, but so far this season, the young guys have been getting a lot of depth. Yeah, I think uh, depth-wise, the only question mark that still remains is quarterback, obviously. Mm-hmm. If Fields gets hurt, uh, what happens then? Uh, with, how does Chubb fit with the first-teamers? Uh, other than that, though, yeah, well, you're right. A lot of those depth questions have been answered by the fact that the backups have seen so much playing time. Master Teague, I think, is the biggest example of that. Yep. Uh, I Was it me or you, Griffin, who wrote an article... They jumbled together when they're that long ago. But in the preseason, one of us wrote an article and talked about that Ohio State didn't have a defined number two running back behind Dobbins and that if something were to happen to Dobbins, then who was going to carry the load? Was it going to? We all thought at that time it was going to be Demario McCall in the media. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, that obviously hasn't turned out. 
I looked up this the other day. Master Teague, as the backup, would be the leading rusher on all but two other Big Ten teams. Yep. That's crazy. That's crazy. That's crazy. And it's actually interesting you bring that up because, um, you know, if you watched last year's game, one of the big standouts, of course, was uh, Anthony McFarland for Maryland. Oh, yeah. Who, of course, had like a, uh, what, like a 300 yard game? 298. 298, yeah. yeah that's crazy. And um, this season so far, you might, and he was just a, he was a true freshman last season, is that correct? Red shirt. Red shirt freshman. Still. Um, putting up that, um, you know, huge of a game against, you know, one of the best teams in the country. Well, yeah, it's the most r- rushing yards Ohio State's ever allowed, I believe. It's either, it's either that it or was, like, yeah, I think that's it was either that or Tim Bianca Batuka. I was going to say that was the one I had in my mind. Yeah, that's but, um, what I was thinking. You might have thought, like, on the heels of that performance for McFarland, personally, he might have came out and had a, you know, a massive season this year. But um, he's only ha- he only has 438 yards right now. Um, you know, not that many more than he had in that one game against Ohio State last season. And he's not even the um, leading rusher on Maryland's team that would go to Javon Leak right now with uh, 150 more yards. So that's kind of um, surprising to see. I would have thought that he would be more of a breakout performer considering um, that performance last season. Maryland's just saving him from Ohio State. Mer- maybe yeah. that is the case. Wasn't that the case last year, though? Like, he wasn't that huge of a player, and then he came out and yeah. had a crazy game So Ohio State. I think yeah, he well, few, uh, he was their leading running back, Yeah, he was though. their, yeah. He was their um, the, the, the fact is that this year he's not really their leading rusher, which is the surprising portion. And Leak mm-hmm. last year was on the team. He ran for 309 yards compared to McFarland's 1,034, which if you – I mean – for the leading running back to have 1,034 yards despite having a 300-yard game is kind of not that impressive. Mm-hmm. But he did. He was coming the week before his 298 game. He had 210 against Indiana, and he had had um, 200-yard rushing games in the first. Yeah, four okay, games you're right. No, it was he was. I remember that now. He um, they hadn't used him much before. He averaged 7.9 a carry. I stand corrected. Um, <laughs> he had very impressive numbers, but um, the thing is, Griffin with this new look Ohio State defense, right? I was, I mean, I'm sure you you all watched it on TV, right? Um, I was the only person among us who was there. What Maryland did at that game is give Ohio State a special look. The two, he had two 75-yard touchdown runs in that game. Uh, And both of them came on a play where Maryland, they lined up heavy, um, you all are familiar with a heavy offensive line, I'm sure. Um, they lined up heavy. Uh, they motioned a jet to the opposite side where McFarland was going to run the ball. And then they ran off tackle, I believe, away from the heavy, uh, the unbalanced line. And that specific look resulted in one player for Ohio State, whoever was the force player, whether it was the corner or the safety, one defensive back was responsible for tackling McFarland. And then he was gone for a touchdown on all those runs. Um, it was a big, big gap in Ohio State's scheme that we had seen exposed to other points in the season uh, against Purdue, namely uh, points against Minnesota where one guy misses a tackle and boom, the guy's off to the races. Um, the thing that's so great about Ohio State's scheme this year is while last year it was so rigid and they couldn't adjust, and we've said this all year, but even what they did last week against Wisconsin, rolling out that 4-4 look, we've seen them use odd fronts. We've seen them play man. We've seen them play zone. All these different things they do, if one thing works, if Maryland again is able to find a home run play all of a sudden, um, which they don't have the same offensive coordinator anymore, I believe, right? I think Canada left. Do you know, Griffin? I'm not 100% sure on that. I need to mm-hmm. look that up. But, um, yeah, after... If they again find that home run element, Ohio State doesn't have to stay in the same defense anymore because they have all these different packages. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely agree. I think the versatility of this Ohio State defense, not just with the ability to bring in different schemes, but just with the fact that, as Clint mentioned, you know, Ohio State has so much depth really that maybe if like one person is struggling, you have so many more people like stepping up to adjust, especially in the linebackers. In the defensive backs, really, there's so much depth that we maybe <sighs> don't necessarily highlight all the time here on the podcast because we just like to rave about Chase Young and the depth the offensive the defensive line has. But you know, I think the key to stopping this Maryland offense and just you know keeping them from really breaking out and like keeping the game competitive for maybe a quarter or two is going to be like how you know effective the secondary and the linebackers are at just you know being flexible with their assignments, I'd yeah. say. Speaking about that, though, um, 
we talk about how much depth this defense has on the D-line and the linebacking court. Um, but the one position I do want to see a little bit more out of are the secondary guys. Um, we know so much about Jeffrey Okuda, Damon Arnett, Sean Wade, and Jordan Fuller, and Brendan White. But, um, like, on the D-line, how we have guys like Tommy Togiai and Zach Harrison and, and um, Haskell Garrett coming in, and then you see the rotation with um, Borland and um, Baron Browning and things like that. We see depth at those positions. But I feel like once the second, the starting secondary comes off, um, we haven't really seen too, too much from the young guys at the defensive back position. And that's the one position I kind of want to see a little more out of out of this week. Well, to highlight a couple guys, and I, I do agree with you, it's shown mm-hmm. the least depth of the defensive mm-hmm. positions, and I think it's been the least consistent, right? Yeah. Uh, whenever all those couple of games that the backups have come in and given up points to a team, obviously Florida Atlantic's the main example, mm-hmm. um, it was kind of the secondary either whether it was missing an assignment when they were coming up to make a tackle or getting beat downfield. But a couple guys have stood out to me. Amir Reap yep. being one. Um, seven kind banks. of mixed. Seven banks, I give. Seven banks. Cameron Brown. They've actually used yeah, Cameron he's Brown. A, he's the next guy up. I think I'll he see. he's going to be the next really good corner after this crop leaves. I'll, also, you didn't mes- mention him, but Justin Wentz having a really nice season, too. So. He's made a couple nice plays. Yeah, couple he, nice plays. They've used him mostly a bullet, though. One really. guy I do want to see more of, though, is Josh Proctor. We've heard so much in camp about this guy. And I think what was the first game of the season where he had his first interception? Yeah, he had his first interception. Yeah, so we were like, okay, this could be a start of something. He had um, a nice tackle. What game was that? Yeah, he came up and made a big hit, and it was still like when the game wasn't yeah. decided. He's been getting some playing time, too. Like sometimes he'll rotate in um, with, the, with the starting guys. But I just kind of want to see more of an impact from him. I think he's looked nice uh, when he's played. It's just yeah. I don't think he's had all that much to do, you know. Exactly. Yeah, I, 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 they, they're in the one high look, and it's Jordan Fuller all the time. And like I think he's the backup at that position. But yeah, yeah, I think a large part of it is really Ohio State hasn't played a major passing threat really this season. Mm-hmm. You could like argue that the best quarterbacks Ohio State has faced so far this season were Brian Lewerke and Jack Cohn. Right, and neither really. Going to the work he did look good in that game. Well, the work he looked very good in that game, but historically he's not known for, like Michigan State's not known for being a very good passing school. No, I mean that's the Big Ten in general. Yeah, yeah but my, in general. outside Ohio State, and yeah. My only fear is that uh, as the season goes on, we're only going to get tougher tests as Penn State, Michigan coming up, and then Big Ten championship in the playoffs or whatever bowl game that they're going to. But I if mean, any of the secondary goes down, I want to know like who's that guy that they can count on. And is he going to be reliable? Because right now, any That's guy fair. that you bring mm-hmm. in, let's be real, the quarterback's going to attack him. Because there's a bit of a dip. Yeah. yeah, I think Cameron Brown has shown flashes, but he's inconsistent. Mm-hmm. I think you could say the same for Reap. We haven't seen enough from Proctor. Um, no, I think that's totally fair. But what is I'll say it's a compliment though to this defense that we're having to nitpick. I yeah. mean, the, our yeah. largest criticism <laughs> of this defense right now. Is hey the backups in the secondary look at look slightly inconsistent when they come in at yeah. the end of games, yeah. but they're talented and they show flashes. We also, have to qualify. Yeah. That position is arguably the hardest play, position to play on the field. Oh, it is. It's very hard so, to play consistently. Yeah. And, 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 and also, we're talking about like the depth, and maybe they haven't had like the playing time or haven't shown enough consistency. But let, like, let's talk about how well this like you. Talk, talked about them briefly, but the starters for the secondary have been yeah. Incredible. Oh yeah, they've been this this in, yeah, yeah. This entire defense, they've they've been healthy and they've been performing a lot better than they have last year. Mm-hmm. Even guys like Chase Young, who we knew were going to have great seasons, are having even way better seasons than they did the year before. So you called like, it. Yeah. So <laughs> you uh, you you were out here tooting the horn before, saying he could go down as the best ever at Ohio State, and we were like, I don't know, but so far it's looking that way. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, he's gonna. He's half a sack from the single season sack record. Eight games in. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty insane. Has um hasn't has yet to have a game without a sack. Yeah. And um, I definitely think he's probably gonna get one against Maryland. I don't think their offensive line is gonna be able to stop him. <laughs> might get a couple. <laughs> well, whether he gets a couple just depends on how long he plays. And really. that's the other insane thing, right? Is like he's putting up these numbers. He's coming out in, <clears> in this. For after the first half, after the third quarter, most of these games. Not only yeah. that, like after the first two drives, the whole offense just changes their game plan. They're like, you know what? We're going away from that guy. And Larry Johnson rotates him all the time because that's yeah. what they do on the D line. Larry Johnson loves to do that. He plays more than other D, any, any other D lineman, but he still gets rotated quite a bit if you watch mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. constantly, whether it's Cooper or Tyreek Smith or Zach Harrison uh, too. Javante Jean Baptiste, Zach Harrison, whoever goes in for him. Um, <laughs> it's just like. Not only the numbers, but in how short of a time span and how much defense offenses know about him, 
all of that combined, he still puts up the things he does. Um, no, Chase Young has had an insane season for sure. All right. Uh, is there anything with Maryland's defense that we think could be threatening for this Ohio State defense? Don't laugh at me, Clint. I'm just bringing Sorry. it up as a topic. <laughs> we know uh, the we know what the answer is. I just want to yeah hear you guys. If anything in the past tells us anything, I would say highly doubtful that this defense even sparks any fear in this Ohio State offense. I'll say one player that might be a fun watch. I don't think he's going to game break and all of a sudden make this a contest. But one interesting player to watch on Maryland's defense is Keandre Jones. Mm-hmm. Um, and Tom Brooks, too. Well, yeah. He's a pretty good player well, himself. Not just because of his numbers, right? He leads the team in si- with six sacks. No other player has more than one. That's <laughs> kind of sad. <laughs> but, um, yeah. but he has six sacks. He's a former Ohio State player. Um, transferred out. Oh, yeah. Uh, to go to Maryland, which he's from Maryland. Yeah. So wasn't he a part of the Dwayne Haskins class? Yeah, no, he yeah. he he helped recruit Dwayne. You're right, he helped recruit Dwayne. So, yeah, um, I think that's a guy that you could you know might come out fired up and play inspired and have a good day. Not that again, it'll be enough As to make know, this a one game. One guy at all. isn't enough to. <laughs> and so this is a football. Yeah. You have twenty two people on the field at once. It's one guy. They're gonna have to bring that out again. Yeah, hard for but I w- yeah I will say though I feel like the only like excitement we could probably get out of this game though is like the first quarter I could feel it feeling like it could be a tight game for just a quick could be little one two maybe you know, a like couple a little, series they but do something they yeah. come out with something um, the thing is they You're lost hand, they though. lost Canada so I did like I went back and looked that up they lost Canada I'm so sorry I didn't know that going in viewers but um, you know Canada was an amazing offensive mind for the team even if his performance as interim head coach wasn't – it was lackluster, right? They had that uh, whole situation that yeah, went down last year. Yeah, there are extenuating year. circumstances that kind of prevented right. the team in, from um, – with the whole, you know – From doing All well. the controversy yeah. that happened. We won't – we don't need to go into detail with that. But um, jumping in there as an interim head coach, he was very, very well-respected offensive mind, and he put that great game plan together against Ohio State that worked uh, last season. Um, now you're without him – and you bring in Loxley, who's kind of – he wasn't exactly a big name hire at head coach. Someone who's been with the program for a long time, paid his dues, loves Maryland football, <coughs> but Loxley isn't um, – he, he's not the caliber hires that we've seen in the Big Ten as of late. Yeah. Scott Frost, um, P.J. Fleck, those kinds. just got an extension. Right. Yeah, they just gonna, uh, well, not not that Frost has proved his medal yet. Fleck has – but Frost hasn't had the chance to really get his recruits. It was yet. a big name hire, regardless. It was. It was, yeah. Regardless, it was a big name hire. And Maryland instead <laughs> said, we're just going to take the career guy who will probably just keep them as a mediocre team mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. below average. I think Maryland's just kind of looking for consistency right now, just kind of looking to get away yeah, from a- some of After like, from all that happened. That happened yeah. That's fair. That's fair. It is kind of hard to, to get consistency in general, though, when you've had four different head coaches in five years. Yeah. <laughs> Maryland has had. I, I feel like Maryland is like saying, well, this guy probably won't leave. Yeah. And as a recruit, like, why would you want to go to a school where you don't know if your coach is going to, the guy who's recruiting is going to be there a year right. from now? Or if, you know, something bad will happen to you. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, as far as their passing game goes, that might be the most embarrassing part of Maryland's uh, team. And that's saying something. Uh, they rank 98th in the country. Their starter completes less than 50% of his throws. Uh, their Tyrell Pigrome is an interesting option off the bench, completes 60% of his throws, and has a little bit of a running threat to him. Uh, he's gone for 173 yards this year. He's done more in the past. He had that big game. when You remember when Maryland upset Texas? He had a couple yes, of big rushing touchdowns that. in that game. But um, That was a fun day. Yeah, they, they're, their quarterback situation isn't one to be jealous of. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do we want to go ahead and do our score predictions for this game right now? Or do you have something to say, Clyde? I was going to say, just um, I know we haven't talked a lot about recruiting, um, but a little bit of big news just happened with yeah, true, yeah. Florida State's uh, firing of their head coach, Willie Tar- Taggart. Um, Jalen Knighton. Yeah, now their uh, 2020 running back recruit, Jalen Knighton, has decommitted from Florida State. And as we know, the only weak spot in this Ohio State recruiting class in 2020 is the fact that they haven't been able to get that – 
running back that they feel like they can replace oh, J.K. Dobbin, yeah, from what and I've, be the future. From what I've heard, though, rumors are that they're not interested in Knighton anymore after how I heard he just got off the phone with, either. I think it was either Ryan Day or... Um, There's a lot of rumors yeah, circulating yeah, so. right now. Uh, B. John Robinson, who they were yeah. thought to be the leader for for a while, cropped up again, but he's not going to come to Ohio State. Uh, he's He's got a huge pull from his family to stay close to home. And this isn't my own insider info. I'm not going to take credit for it. This is stuff I've read yeah. on yeah. other I'm websites. Saying, saying I don't like, have those recruiting yeah. connections. Um, so this mainly comes from um, my former employer uh, rivals and from Letterman Row, those people that yeah. make a career reporting, recruiting, reporting on recruiting. Yeah. But um, the, what we've heard from around the beat is B. Jan Robinson is not interested in coming to Ohio State because of his family ties. Which they sucks. don't want him. They want him close to home. Yeah, uh, he's from Texas. As a recruit, why, I mean, I could. I feel like that's a very difficult position to be in if, if you're B. John, because it's like, why would you want to stay and committed to a program like Texas, who well, he, consistently underperforms? I mean, just to stay home. So the thought home. is he might go to USC or yeah. somewhere yeah. else close. That's um, I mean, you know, USC is not much better of a program. I mean, if they get, but Urban. I get it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, if you now, have an opportunity at Ohio State where they're consistently producing top. Backs in the NFL. Um, There's definitely that. But at the yeah. same time, like, he's got to do what makes him happiest. Exactly. And his family, so absolutely. him and his family happiest. So definitely no um, ill will or disrespect toward Bijan at all. Yeah. Not yeah. that we care if he comes here. And, so, then, yeah. and then and then with Knight, and I, there's just been a lot of rumors about how things ended when Knight and originally re- recruited to – like committed to, committed to like Florida State and everything, and how that ended between them, kind of on bad terms between Ohio State and yeah. Nyan. So, well, it'll be interesting to see whether Nyan actually is interested in considering. I mean, Ohio he did State. say though he he is going to be an early enrollee, which is going to put a lot of pressure on his timetable as far as finding yeah. a commitment. Um, and I know um, he's rumors are saying that he's been on the phone with <laughs> Ohio State as recently. So, I feel like. In his position, we'll see what's going to happen, but that's an, a name to keep an eye on if you're an Ohio State fan on potential commitments. Yeah, absolutely. To this crazy 2020 class. Yeah, right. And uh, Florida State now looking for a uh, new head coach after mm-hmm. the and a new running back. <laughs> the uh, after the the run of interesting events that was tenure of their previous yeah. head coach. It's yes. crazy how um, fast a, a school can fall off. Yeah, Literally. no, I mean. Jimbo leaves. And I mean, just look at what happens in Nebraska. I mean, they're not. You're talking from the 90s? Well, yeah, no, going no, from no. the 90s to like the mid 2000s, where like. Yeah, they were like really. They went from being the best program in the country in the late 90s to like to like the Bill Callahan <laughs> era and the Bo <laughs> Clean era, where they were just like a middling like team that would win nine games at most. Yeah. Well, you always got to bring Nebraska. <laughs> yeah. it's, a good, it's a good example, guys. Uh, I didn't want to say it. <laughs> it was, no, it is a good example. It's just funny. Fine. Hey, Michigan going <sighs> Michigan going it's okay. from. It's, okay. right, it's, it's fine. Okay. It's fine. We so get the Rich it. Rodriguez it and the Brady Hoke are there. there. Oh, my God. It's, no, dude, we're messing with No, it. but what I was trying to say was Florida State, how – in the early, in what was it, 2013, they were in the national championship with Jameis Swinston. They looked like they were going to be leading the pack, one of the top teams every single year. And it's like, fast forward seven years later, and now they even it's made like, the playoffs in 14. Yeah, and yeah. now you look at them and they're, just, they're that was one a of those bad Florida State team though that made yeah. the playoffs. Yeah, they got blown out. They um, Oregon destroyed them. Yeah, yeah. And so <laughs> anyway, we've talked a lot about this Maryland game. Right. I think <laughs> it's time to bring Griffin back into the fold and talk about the Cincinnati game. Basketball. Basketball. For all you basketball fans, the season opener coming up tomorrow. All right. Griffin, kind of walk us through what's going to go on tomorrow. How's Ohio State shaping up? Yeah, I mean, it is their highest preseason rank in six seasons. The first time they've been um, ranked in the preseason in five years. Um, what was the last time? Was it when Aaron Kraft was here? Russell. A twenty thirteen fourteen, oh. um, Russell. So six that, seasons ago, that was when they were ranked number eleven in the preseason. The year after that, they were ranked number twenty. Oh, and then, okay. okay. Um, what was? Let's let's take a little look at that. As a matter of fact, what team what, was that? that uh, was that the D'Angelo Russell team? They didn't end up panning out so hot that year. Um, I remember I was there for for the first game that season, and D'Angelo Russell looked like a a star right away. You could tell right away on the oh, in the yeah. first game. I remember and, uh, I caught on a little bit. 
his passing Wait. ability really more than anything else was just like remember next that level. like missile he threw from down the court to Jay Sean Tate that one game where he yeah. just like yeah. chucked it with one hand. Yeah. Mm. His passing was ridiculous at yes. Ohio State. Mm-hmm. Yes. So and that's kind of how really he good. first got integrated in, in the offense, and then the, sc- the scoring came like a f- you know a little later on, a little bit later on. Just right. he was more of a. Um, I feel it, like yeah, he took it, it to the Rackmore in college. It, it was, than he did his it was the Angelo Russell's team. Yeah, it was the Angelo's. Yeah. Yeah. I just looked it up. They ended up like what losing in the. No, they, we got to the tournament. They lost in the first round, I believe. Jay, so, it was also Jay Sean Tate's uh, freshman year. Right, right, right. So, but yeah, um, uh, Chris Holtman said that he thinks this is the the. Um, the hardest season opener he's had as a coach. Cincinnati, like, um, you know, Cincinnati's a, a good program. I mean, that's a hard-nosed team. Um, they're better in, in uh, basketball than they are football, generally speaking. Um, they're in the AAC now, um, and they've been they've had a top three record in the conference for, like, the last, I think, every season that they've, they've been in there since um, the Big East, the end of the Big East. They're one of the, the the power Ohio teams because um, Ohio's had Xavier, Dayton, Cincinnati, and Ohio State, but Ohio State hasn't been that top team in the state. It's usually been Cincinnati and Xavier, um, so this will be a pretty good test, I would say, for Ohio State. Yeah. Yep. Uh, Cincinnati known for playing great defense, but overall, as you look at this team, it's interesting. They have such talent, but they're very young still. Um, I've brought this. Um, I, our season preview will go up tomorrow morning for this team, and – uh, if you look around the roster, you've got seven players who are going to be key contributors to this team who uh, are either underclassmen or, in C.J. Walker's place of case, have never put on an Ohio State uniform before. So uh, the youth and the inexperience of the team, and then you combine it with, and not to say Walker's inexperienced, but he's he's new to Ohio State, um, you combine it with the, old, the three older guys, Kyle Young, uh, Caleb Wesson, and Andre Wesson, um, th- the dynamics of it are going to be interesting. I yep. think how the lineups mm-hmm. exactly work out, how yeah. they play guys. Yeah, and I think everyone uh, likes to focus, especially in college basketball, on the freshmen because, you know, freshmen, the, the best freshmen are who are getting picked at the top of the draft generally, and that's why everyone wants to, to know, like, who are these new young guys coming in? Could they have a season like D'Angelo Russell, if you're a guy like DJ Carton, where you come in and, um, you know, you're a, you're a highly touted recruit and then you kind of overachieve expectations even and end up being like a – you know, the second overall pick in the draft or something like that. Yeah. And, uh, but I think that's why Chris Holtman has tried to like temper everybody's expectations in terms of the freshmen because at the end of the day, um, those guys that Andy's talking about, those, the returning guys, wh- whether it be Andre Wesson, uh, Kyle Young, Caleb Wesson, and even a couple of, uh, you know, sophomore guys like Luther Muhammad, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, other than Caleb Wesson, some of those guys are just, they're very like glue pieces on a team, I mm-hmm. think. And not a lot of them, you know, are these like go to score. They they're more of a utility guys, I would say. Yeah. And um, I think Holtman wants to see, you know, can Andre Wesson score a little bit more this year? Can he, you know, um, shoot better from from uh, outside? He said that Andre Wesson was shooting like forty percent from three in preseason work, yeah. which would be better than he's uh, average in the past. Um, and can Kyle Young? I'm Kyle Young isn't like a polished, a super polished scorer. Can he? be a guy that can score some puck buckets out of the low post rather than just getting those kind of workman points off of offensive rebounds and stuff. Can those guys take a step up? Because if they do, it'll help those young guys be able to to play with less pressure on themselves, you know, to yeah. be like the mm-hmm. saviors of this team. Even Luther can come out and have a pretty crazy scoring season because coming out of high school, he was one of the nation's kind of like top in like electric scorers on offense, and that's kind of his game. He's more of an offensive um, weapon. So last year, I feel like he kind of underperformed um, as a freshman. But this season, who knows? He can't. We're looking for him to be more um, consistent. Really, Chris Holtman uh, always said the strength of his game was his on-ball defense, too. Though um, he was he's, he was a very good on-ball defender last year. Um, First stretches, there was times when he was inconsistent. Yeah, I think mean, uh, there's times he gives up a little bit, like in that scrimmage they had against um, Cedarville. When he got a little crossed up, and what was it, number two for Centerville, um, Cedarville came up and had that nice slam. Yep. Um, I'm telling you, his, his defense is kind of – it can be there, but it's not consistent. He's not one of their, like, lockdown mm-hmm. guards. Yeah. When, uh, and then – Well, yeah, the other thing – sorry. The other thing on Luther is, like, I his efficiency overall, I think, needs yeah. to improve. Mm-hmm. He shot worse from the field than he did from three last season, which, to be fair, he shot – he shot good from three. He shot three seventy five, um, but you shoot 
shooting 37% from the field as a guard is not something you no, it's see not a deal. Yeah. ever. Um, and, you know, it's just it's it's weird in general to be shooting worse from the field than you do from three. Um, you know I'm saying he just go he goes on streaks is is kind of what it is. It's like you will see some games where he has flashes of like, wow, his he can create game is right. Like, yeah, mm-hmm. he gets he gets himself open. The problem is knocking it down. Sometimes. Exactly. Yep. Uh, one player that I'm interested in to see how he's going to factor into the Ohio State uh, team is CJ Walker. You know, he had to sit out last season as for transferring from Florida State. And now we can finally see what he can bring to the table. After seeing him live um, against Cedarville, I will say, like as far as guard wise, he's one of he's probably going to be one of their better defenders. Mm-hmm. As long uh, as I mean, as, alongside uh, Carton, um, them two guards, but CJ Walker, that that's where he most impressed me in the scrimmage game was on the defensive end. You could tell he's very aggressive, um, and, and he has a lot of great technique on defense, and and that's one thing that I liked about him. Yeah, and that you saw that aggression. He tried to bring that on the offensive side as well. Yeah. But uh, Chris Holman talked about it, and we talked about this last episode as well. But um, I thought he was Walker kind of forced a lot of drives there. He was kind of just crashing to the hoop, and um, yeah. and he wasn't. He's a smaller guy, yeah. and he he looks pretty small on the court too. And even against Cedarville, who was not going to be the biggest team that they face <laughs> no. all season, and he had his shot block a couple of times. He just had a, a couple of just wild drives trying to get shots up, and that's understandable for a guy that's been you know, sideline for so long to try to, you know, Mm -hmm. get some rhythm going with some some shots. But I thought he was forcing a little bit there, and I think Chris Holman thought that as well, which is probably why you saw him play a little bit less than DJ Carton, who he did start over um, to start the game there. Um, And, yeah, so C.J. Walker, and I was going to bring up also Dwayne Washington. That's what I was thinking Um, too, yeah. He he was just not good in that that exhibition. He went (laughs) one for seven. One for seven. Against, yeah, like maybe times. the worst team they're gonna. He didn't play. look good in practice day either. Watching practice, no. And that's yeah, that's another one of those sophomores that um, Chris Holman likes to talk about. Where like those guys are just are question marks for me. The performance of Luther Muhammad, like Justin Arns, and um, and Dwayne Washington, kind of those like wing guys, um, inconsistent last year, um, and you know. From a couple of them, I, th- I don't think that exhibition really cleared up what role they're really going to have on the team. But we probably won't s- we won't know that until a couple games in. But uh, I think those guys have to have to be productive, efficient guys for the team to be able to prove that number eighteen uh, status right now. Yeah, and they're going to be tested against Cincinnati. Um, they have Cincinnati has their um, senior guard uh, Jaron um, Cumberland, who is a pretty good scorer. Um, he averaged eighteen points per game last nineteen points per game last season. Um, and was one of the, I would say, one of the better players in, in the entire country. So I feel like offensively um, is where his game is is more tailored towards, and, and defensively, Ohio State will be challenged. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So talking about how, you know, a lot of these players who are maybe like a year or two into the program need to step up, mm-hmm. but let's hi- highlight some of the freshmen that are coming in, some highly it's touted great recruits. Class. Yeah, great class, like – Carton definitely leads like this class, and we're all expecting him to step up really and kind of become the new leader of this team once Caleb Wesson leaves. Yeah, yep. Yeah. And he had a stretch where he scored like um, him and Caleb Wesson accounted for 15 straight um, Ohio State points in the exhibition the other day in like a three minute span, which is pretty impressive. And uh, that's why I wrote a, an article about that uh, just yesterday about how they really were playing like a two man game there. Which is really nice to see for Ohio State fans and uh, and coaches, you know, because you have your your best player on the team in Caleb Wesson, and the fact that he's already got kind of this chemistry with you know who, the person that's expected to be the the best player coming in, right? Yeah. And uh, and it's an inside outside duo like that. And uh, the interesting thing is that now Caleb Wesson, you know, started his career being that low post interior presence, but now, as we saw in the exhibition game, hitting three or four threes, he can step out a little bit. And with Carton's um, athleticism and explosiveness, he can get inside and be a problem as well. Yeah. So you're going to see those guys playing off each other a lot, I think, um, mm-hmm. whether it be pick-and-roll stuff, uh, pick-and-pop stuff, um, or even a Carton uh, throwing it into to Wesson um, where he likes it down low as kinda, well. Kind of bringing back the dynamic almost. We Like a couple of years ago when you had like Jay Shantae and KB, KB, KB had really nice chemistry and really – Kind of led that team to you know their tournament run. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and this is one of the the, the better um, freshman classes I think we've ever seen at Ohio State, um, especially under Chris Holtman. This is his best class yet, um, with three of the top fifty prospects um, in the twenty nineteen class. Obviously led by DJ Carton, who's the fourth best point guard in the nation, um, and 
in that scrimmage, he looked really, really good scoring the ball on defense in transition um, when, and was even able to get some steals. So I think he'll be obviously the, the, the cornerstone of this class, but um, other guys to look forward to are EJ Little um, or Liddell. I don't know why I keep calling him Little. <laughs> but Alonzo Gaffney is the kind of like the the gadget player where we don't re- – I feel like he'll be the guy where – it may take a couple of years for us to really see his potential because right now he has a lot of potential. He's really long and lanky. Um, but those are a couple of guys I'm kind of excited to watch as the season goes on. You know who I think the most underrated player is on this team? Ooh. Justin Ahrens. Really? I agree with that, actually. Yeah. Really? I, he. You remember he dropped 30 uh, in that one game last year? <laughs> I do, yeah. 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 Was- Dude, I was at that practice today. I think I saw him miss one shot. Really? He, uh, he's he got a sweet stroke right now. Yeah. I think... Um, Really, he showed a lot of flashes from behind the arc last year. Yeah. And getting some of that out as a freshman, that some of the inconsistencies of it, mm-hmm. yeah. I think will help. He might not start for this team. He might not be the sixth man even. But I think he'll, have flashes. he'll come. He might be a guy that comes in and gives you 12 off the bench, just knocking down three threes. You know, yeah, I agree. He's with still that. coming off that uh, back injury that's kind of plagued him all off season, but um, we'll see if that if that improves if that improves his game as well. I think the thing that's exciting about this team is that, um, for once, it doesn't feel like this team only has like six, seven guys. Like we can probably go like ten deep on this team of guys who can actually get on the court and make an impact. Um, and just the different amount of lineups that this team can use. Is, is, is something to watch as the season goes on because I feel like we won't really see a consistency of five strict guys in the starting lineup. We may see uh, a lineup that consists of DJ Carton and CJ Walker at the same time. Um, and you, you have Luther Muhammad at the guards, and then you also have those bigs um, like Kyle Young and DJ Liddell um, and, and, and Kayla Wesson. So we'll see a lot of different guys get action. Um, and I think we'll have a bunch of games where we have – Guys off the bench, such as um, Justin Ahrens, who who goes off every once in a while. Mm-hmm. And we didn't, you didn't even mention Andre Wesson in that at no. all. And yeah. He's definitely going to be in there in the starting lineup mix. So I think there's only two guys really in the starting lineup who are kind of a lock for the entire season, and that's on the two Wesson brothers, um, Andre and Caleb Wesson. Those two have kind of earned their stripes in the Ohio State program, um, and and Andre being a senior, I feel like he's the one guy um, Holtman's going to look after just for leadership. Um, and, and obviously, Andre brings a lot of different elements to the game, um, and he's one of their best shooters from deep. But I think them two are the only locks, and then you'll see a lot of different variations of guys who could play at the guard position and power forward and mix it up. I think you'll get Kyle Young in there too um, as a lock for a while until the freshman, um, until like EJ Liddell comes Yeah, I was say, as soon as EJ Liddell comes off and yeah, starts yeah. popping off, I like see. him a lot too, yeah. especially in uh, and they're kind of less effective now in the NBA, but in college ball, like the just like a, a bigger, uh, strong, athletic uh, power forward. Mm-hmm. Th- those are effective players in uh, in college basketball. Yeah, and um, that's that definitely describes him. Yeah, we were talking about um, like what lineup we would project if if it was up to us of who would start. Um, and me and Griffin kind of agreed, and I would say it would be um, DJ Carton at the at the point, Luther Muhammad at the two, Andre Wesson at the three. Um, you'd have EJ Liddell at the four and Kayla Wesson at the five. Um, yes, that's two of the freshmen in the starting lineup, and I think it would give a, a lot of versatility. Um, it it it'd allow this offense to space the floor, and you'd have great defense um, and energy on the floor. But I feel like the reason why we probably won't see that lineup is because we need that spark off of the bench. Um, and I feel like after watching one game in the in the exhibition game. DJ Carton was definitely in that spark off the bench, um, which is probably why we'll see. And also um, the fact that CJ Walker is has sat out a whole year and has come off of um, come from playing in the ACC with Florida State. So I think he'll obviously be the starting point guard for a lot of the season. Um, but who knows? We'll see what the lineups be. Yeah, it would it would just ruffle some feathers with some of the older yeah. guys if they yeah. were to and you know, te- establish the freshmen and really like guys. integrating the freshmen and like uh, assimilating them into the team chemistry. It should be like one of Holtland's like main priorities. Yeah, because think about it, right. the two guys that I added into the lineup, um, DJ, 
who's a freshman, but then you have CJ Walker, who literally sat an entire year on the bench, yeah. waiting for his chance, knowing that um, CJ uh, from last year, CJ Jackson was going to be leaving. And then you also have Kyle Young, who's been in this program for what is it like three years now? Third year, yeah, he's, third, yeah, he's a junior. Yeah, three years now. So and 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 he played a huge role last season. So yeah, like you said, Griffin, I think it'll ruffle some feathers. Not that I think it matters as a coach. I feel like that's the reason why you're a coach. Um, you yeah. have to make tough decisions and play the best players. Mm -hmm. um, but we'll see as the season goes on. I think right now, I think he has the right lineup in. Um, where right now it's it's kind of a the freshmen have to earn their way onto the court. And like he said, they're all probably going to get playing time as the season goes on. Um, but as far as getting into the starting lineup, these guys will definitely have to earn their way up. Yep. Well, I think that's all we can really have time for basketball-wise. Let's kind of shift back to talk about football just a little bit. College football playoff rankings are coming out for the first time tonight in a couple <laughs> hours. I just wanted to open up the table to see kind of like what our top four is. I'm tired be. of that AP poll. Yeah. I'm no no more AP poll. I'm now we're actually going off of stuff that I'm matters. on AP style. <laughs> Associated press poll. Yeah, yeah. I'm, 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 I'm on the Joel Klatt wave right now. Joel Klatt. He's been tooting a horn all season long about how stupid the preseason rankings are and and nothing that a team has done last season, um, sh it, it shouldn't have an effect on this year's uh, rankings. And I feel like the AP poll has done that where they did their uh, preseason rankings based off of last season's ending. Um, and they've kind of just consistently kept it like that until it, like, it took them how long for Clemson to drop just a little bit in Ohio State. They even dropped back to six after still blowing teams out. Um, I mean, that was kind of warranted. But this season, I, I don't know. I'm excited for this ranking because I feel like this will be their first real rankings mm -hmm. um, that judges strictly off of this season. Yeah. Well, what, well what's your top four then, Glenn? Uh, all right. My top four. I would probably say to date, LSU one, Ohio State two, Alabama three, Clemson four, and my first out would be Penn State, and I'd have Georgia at six. All right. Um, probably. I mean, not much has changed since. Not much has changed since last week. I mean, all the top teams were on buys, or in Clemson's ca case, playing a team that might as well have been a buy in Wofford. <laughs> Um, no, that's a quality opponent. What right a there. great November game! That's, right? No, that's a that is a quality opponent in basketball. <laughs> um, oh, Wofford's a Wofford. tournament team consistently. In yeah, basketball. they are. Um, <laughs> anyway, that's that's my that's my go to for th four over three. Up could you imagine? Upset. Could you imagine the scrutiny Ohio State would get if they played? Let's say. Um, I, I, let's just say they I, played I think Wofford. Clemson, Clemson's facing gr scrutiny for their schedule. Anyway, yeah, Ohio State's number one for me right now. Um, Really, LSU's best wins aren't looking as great as they did. Mm -hmm. Texas has turned out to be pretty bad. Um, I mean, Florida, Auburn, or good teams. Florida, Florida, but let's be real. Florida I don't think anyone yet has really great wins because even Ohio State. Even Ohio State's when it gets Wisconsin now. That's the, Yeah, no one really has great wins yet. That's my point. Ohio State has looked like the better team. Just the true, eye test. True, uh, yeah. I think Ohio State has looked like the most complete team in college football. You point at them and you say, where's the hole? Mm -hmm. Assuming, yeah, everyone who needs to stays healthy. Scream! Yeah. I think them. I think Ohio State definitely wins if you're looking at the eye test. Just as a more complete team, but LSU right now does have the better win. Florida is still a better yeah. win. Over That's the Wisconsin. only reason why I have LSU number one. Yeah, I, I still I mean, believe they have. Florida better still win. lost, but their losses are to LSU and Georgia, whereas like Wisconsin's lost. Georgia to lost to SC. No. Um, no. I mean, All right, so hold on. Who's the rest of yours? You're talking. So I have Ohio State, LSU, Alabama, Clemson. Um, as I think Al. Clemson's, Clemson honestly is rebounded and they're starting to look like yeah, we thought they might Clemson. before the season, but um, that's they're still not like I think they overall you look at the whole picture those other three teams have looked better on this, uh, on the whole this season. Um, first team out is probably Penn State and then Georgia. And, yeah, I think uh, actually no. I'm going to go Oregon. Yeah, but, uh, that's, really? That's, 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 yeah, that's actually where I'm standing. Yeah, I'm going over who? Georgia. 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 Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. I respect that. I Oregon, that and I'd oh. actually if if I had to, I'd put Georgia eight, and I'd put them behind Utah too. Utah, wow. really no. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean no? <laughs> no. Well, Utah. Let me no. <laughs> let me let me step in. I'll give my uh, top four quickly. Uh, I'll go Ohio State number one just because I do value the eye test. I think they are the be the better team. Plus, Switch. I just. 
Plus, I don't know, LSU and Alabama playing this week, so that kind of looms over these rankings for now just because, like... Winner of that game will jump Ohio State. Yeah, like, the winner, the winner of that game is probably going to be my new number one, and, you know, LSU hasn't been Alabama recently. So, we'll see. But I have Ohio State number one, LSU number two. I will go Alabama three. Clemson's my number four, but it is... And Clemson's lo- been looking a lot better recently, but I still think Penn State uh, definitely has a argument to be in the top four right now. So your first two out. First two out, Penn State would be my number five. I'll go Oregon number six because Oregon's only loss is to Auburn, and that was a pretty close game. Close, close game. I think Oregon's looked very good for the rest of the season. They're like the one Pac-12 team. And that, that was has, week one, wasn't it? That was a, that was opening week two. So and then yeah, that, so and that kind of like knocked Oregon out of the top ten. They've slowly been creeping their way back up, and they actually have been looking pretty good right now. I like so. that too, but I don't know. I just feel like if they were if Georgia and Oregon were to play today, I feel like Georgia would win. But that doesn't really matter. Mm-hmm. How about you, Griff? What do yeah, you think? Man, I don't disagree with Khalid's list there. I still think LSU number one right now, but Ohio State number two over Alabama. But of course, that might change uh, this weekend. Mm-hmm. Um, I, we'll be watching that one. Uh, probably doing some doing some work after the game. Mm-hmm. I would imagine. And um, and then number four, Clemson. Five, Penn State. Then Georgia. I would say. Okay. Um, do you th- yeah, bro. Well, Same well, teams. just 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 <laughs> one brief question. Do you think if Oregon wins out with the way they are in their one last Pac-12 championship, do you think they have like a legitimate argument to get into the playoff? Yes. say like a one. Absolutely. Well, well, say 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 LSU's only loss is to Alabama. I still think they get in. That's an impressive. You've now beaten the only team to beat Oregon in that case, though. Uh, it's a, I, there'd be death. There'd be a I'm, definite. I'm just talking argument. about with like how like the Pac-12 recently has been more of the, a weaker conference. Even now, as the season's been going on, they so, haven't been really getting like, a lot of I, respect. But I say this: going to be in the SEC champs, going to be in Clemson it's wins out, in. they'll be in. Mm-hmm. Uh, so then, then yeah, the, the argument thing. basically comes down to you, you if Oklahoma value, wins out. If Oklahoma wins out, I don't think Oklahoma has a chance. If if Oregon wins out and um, LSU's a one loss team or Alabama. Yeah, or Alabama, whatever team or the one-loss team, I feel like Oklahoma doesn't have a chance because one Alabama or LSU's one loss is going to be a lot better than Oklahoma's. And on top of that, Oregon has lost week one to Auburn, which is not a bad loss, and it was a close game. So Mm -hmm. I feel like those two teams, um, the loser of Alabama, LSU, and and Oregon will have a way better chance at getting into the playoffs than Oklahoma. So that's why I just feel like if if all the teams went out, or Oklahoma would be the mm-hmm. oddball out, and then it'd be kind of a what do you value more? Um, well, the, Oklahoma would then have would then beat Baylor twice, and Baylor's undefeated right now, so that would help their resume a little bit. It could, but I just feel like a um, Plus, Oregon, Oregon winning their conference championship and LSU or Alabama not winning their conference championship would be my deciding factor. So I would give a slight edge to Oregon, and then you'd have uh, to be judging. Oregon, no, no, in my I, opinion, Oregon and Oklahoma, and I feel like yeah, I'm Oregon not, has I'm not disagreeing resume. with you. I just think it's, you know, a legitimate argument I to have. A, yeah, it's an uphill battle, and we've seen it a couple of years ago with Ohio State, but when you lose a bad loss like that, like later into the season, like in the middle of the season, it really comes back to hurt you. But when you have an early loss like Ohio State did to Virginia Tech uh, when they won the championship, and it's that early in the season, then your chances of getting to the playoffs are a lot better. Mm-hmm. So we, that's just how the committee has been lately. So yeah. we'll see if they keep consistent with that. Well, yeah, well, by the time this podcast is up, we'll you'll you'll know what the rankings are. But we're just kind of speculating. I have a question: right now. Like, Do you guys believe that um, the committee will go Alabama and LSU one and two, just specifically for the one two matchup ratings? Yeah, you think, I think they will? Say it might. I don't know if it's necessarily for the TV ratings, but I think Alabama and LSU are going to be one and two. Really, I think yeah. Ohio State. I think Ohio State might be too. I think LSU. I think, yeah. I, I think LSU for sure is gonna be number one. Okay. I would so not be think, surprised if Ohio State jumps. So you don't think they'll do it for the? I mean, they they easily themselves. could. I won't be surprised if they do it. I My just, projection of how the committee ranks yeah, it as far as the a committee? top six would be Ohio's. Would not be sorry. The LSU, Alabama, Ohio State, Clemson, um, Penn State, Penn State, yeah, and then probably Georgia, honestly, but maybe Oregon. That's a good. Just that's the one that I really don't know. I'd say Oregon. I'd Oregon. say Oregon. I just don't know. I just we'll just. Well, I'm see. saying the committee is going to say Oregon. That's what I was saying. But yep. yeah. Okay. Yeah. All I know is Justin Field says if they put him at number 25, he doesn't care. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> that's a lie. Big bad. <laughs> 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 wow. Bit of an embellishment there, but. Oh. 
we'll have more to talk about next week when we actually can look at who wins between LSU and Alabama, and we'll actually just have like the actual rankings to go off yeah. of. It'll be very interesting to see. Like this is the part of the season where things are really starting to ramp up. Not necessarily for Ohio State because we got two weeks. Of things really shake up. Easy games, but tonight. then you know Penn State, Michigan are not far off, and then Big Ten championships. So. Back after the season, this is when things start to get real. Yeah, this is when every week starts getting real nervous because yeah. now it's no longer the AP poll. Now it's the committee who's deciding, yeah. and the committee is the one that you're trying to impress. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But I do think that's all we have time for today. Thank you very much if you're still with us. Hope you enjoyed this episode. Stay tuned this week for our coverage of the Maryland game and also our coverage of men's basketball as their season gets underway. And stay tuned next week as we get ready for the Rutgers game and more. Uh, from Andy Anders, Clint Hashi, and Griffin Strum, I'm Brian Nelson, and this has been The Best Damn Pond Land. Thank you very much for watching. Peace! <laughs>